827 and 830. Can't call it before 830. All right. Round it. Okay. 830. But you trust your watch rather than it's, it's GPS. <laughs> <laughs> that is intentionally set slow. Um, it looks like 830. So we don't start early. It is now 8.30. Okay, great. Thanks for cluing me in on that. Oh, right. So, um, Ms. Quincy Cromer, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I would. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. March Retirement Report, Quarterly Trustee Education and Training Report. Um, is there any discussion uh, regarding the consent agenda? I just had one comment. It said Gina for, was that Gina? The Gina Barton. Barton. Okay, no, I thought it was Katrina. Sister. Sister. sister, sister, yeah. Well, Gina did the swearing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, without objection, the, the consent agenda can be adopted by unanimous consent. Okay, adopted by unanimous consent. Um, discussion and possible action regarding investment matters. Uh, monthly investment report. You guys are up already. Callan is here with us today, Madam Chair, to talk us through the monthly investment report, the investment Hi. belief statement, and additional asset classes for consideration in the upcoming asset liability study. <laughs> Greg and Claire, take it away. How are you? Good, good to see you today. all. Uh, so we have a, a few items today, uh, the monthly performance report, um, as well as I think we're going to touch on the investment beliefs again, which had a rewrite, and then we're going to have an educational session on uh, different asset classes you can consider uh, when we do the next uh, asset liability session. Um, so do you want us to talk about the investment report first, the monthly? Um, Is that what's on the... It's, that's what's on the agenda, okay. but whatever works best. Okay, that's great. Uh, just a real quick uh, um, update here. Um, capital markets continue to go up in the, um, in the month of March, and that was great news following, remember, fourth quarter was brutal. Uh, we're now up to uh, about $518 million at the end of March, and that represented about $3.1 million in investment gains. Again, these returns are preliminary because we don't include the real estate portfolio. We don't have valuations in for that yet. Uh, so the returns are probably going to be actually just a little bit higher than what we're reporting uh, today. Um, and the next time we come back and see you, we'll have a more full and in-depth review of first quarter performance. But overall, it's a, it's a pretty good story for March. Okay. Well, that's good news. Yeah. And I'll, you know, however you want to, whatever you want to do first or whatever, it's up to you. Um, well, I think the investment beliefs is probably a good place to start. Um, so uh, we met a, a few months ago, and we talked about investment beliefs. And at that time, we had a draft of a number of core beliefs um, that, uh, that we had and shared it with you. And there wasn't a lot of debate about, they all seemed to resonate pretty well with the group. Um, and, uh, and James took the lead into honing them in into a few core beliefs of, uh, you know, one through seven here. And, um, we uh, were fully supportive of all of them, and I think they're pretty consistent with what we reviewed in the past. Um, and I think with this, it's an open discussion item. If, if there's anything here that anyone has a, a question about, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to review 
the updated document? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Do, do you have any questions about the core beliefs or any comments? Would it be helpful to... I don't have a question particularly about the belief statements, but as an educator, can I make a couple of comments? Sure. The, in the very first belief, I think it just started out reading a little bit um, awkward because it says that uh, that uh, MCR is a long-term investor and focuses on, and then the very next sentence, as a long-term investor, it focuses on, and now we focus on something different. It's just the wording that focuses on and belief in. It just, it got me started off on the wrong foot. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> okay. Yep. And then the other thing was, every one of the beliefs is really a statement except for number one. You know, simple is often better. Public investment markets are largely efficient, all of that. And then number one's just a noun long-run investment horizon, so I don't know. But just a statement about, is that, you know, something, a, a sentence. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is it, what should it say? Uh, focus on long-run investment horizon or something. I mean, you know, just a statement rather than, sorry, I'm not an English teacher. <laughs> well, <laughs> don't say sorry, I thought number two was number one because I thought that was just a general statement, so yeah. I Okay. 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 Um, so um, make sure I understand. Uh, so there's for, no verb in there. Yeah. There's no verb in. Yeah. I oh in, in okay. I was reading the paragraph. Yeah. You oh, mean no. in the right. belief the title. In yes. the title. There's no okay. verb. Thank you. Are you an English teacher? No. <laughs> <laughs> My grammar is horrible. <laughs> but you recognize But I have an word. editor at the house. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Long run. Is it simply adding is? I'm sure it matters. In the long run, interest rate matters. Or, yeah. or, or focus or, or on the long run on investment horizon. Yeah. Okay. Emsera is a long, Emsera has a long run investment horizon, I'm sure. Okay. Any, any uh, opinions on what it should be? Do you want us to just come back with something? Or? Sure. <laughs> you say numerous times later the focus on a long run investment right. horizon, so I think that would be a little cool. so, so focus on long run investment horizon. You, you know, are an English major, aren't you? <laughs> are you? That really, that that really good. Good. So okay. right. good. There we go. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> and there's your verb. And I'm science, so I don't do this. Well. <laughs> but I knew something wasn't right. <laughs> Well, I'll confess, I drafted this language, so don't blame, don't blame Greg and Claire. Uh, this is all on me. You have to have parallel construct. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that word. The PhD at the table. There's no such thing as good writing, only good rewriting. That's right. Hey, Greg, any other comments about the investment beliefs? Thank you for those edits. I think okay. it's good. All right. Okay. And now we'll, we'll get into uh, kind of the heart of our presentation today. I don't know how do I get back to the agenda? And um, as a uh, preamble, um, we're going to be conducting a uh, asset liability study with you. And recall we did this three or four years ago. And in that study, we take your liabilities as projected by your actuary, and we say, okay, given these liabilities, cash flow needs, what is the right asset allocation for you in the long run? And one of the building blocks we need to know before we do that study is what asset classes should we consider in that mix? And over the years, we've gone through and we have talked about other asset classes you could consider. Um, and we're going to do that again today and come up with other asset classes that you think might be appropriate to put into as a building block in the asset liability study. A couple things we've noted over the years is that our investment program, while it's been very successful, is heavily dependent on public markets, uh, the stock and bond market. Um, and that has its advantages that it's 
liquid, it's transparent, um, and equities win in the long run. So it should provide a high return in the long run. But when you have a lot of focus on just a few asset categories, it means that you're less diversified than other plants. And it means that your performance can be up and down, and you could look different from other plants from time to time. Now, in aggregate, when you look at the performance for EMSRA, it's been quite strong. And so there's nothing wrong with it, uh, but it is a more volatile pattern than some other plants exhibit. So today we're going to walk through and talk about other asset categories that you could consider. At the conclusion of the presentation, there are a few things that we could do. You, at one, at one outcome is you say, uh, Greg, we agree with your, um, what you're telling us, telling us today, and we think that there, these two asset categories are what we want you to model in the asset liability study, in addition to our current asset uh, classes. Um, alternatively, you could say, uh, uh, you haven't given us enough information about this specific asset category, and I'd like you to come back and do a, a deeper dive on this one asset category. Um, so or I think, two. <laughs> or, or two, and we'd be and we'd be glad to do it. There's no rush in in um, making a decision today that's going to be a five or ten year investment decision that you make. Okay, so we'll walk through a number of asset classes you can consider, and, and Claire's going to be doing the heavy lifting talking today. Um, and um, but to give you a bit of the synopsis. Um, we're going to walk through all of these, and in our opinion, the couple asset classes that make the most sense for you to consider are infrastructure, and we spent a lot of time talking about that last year, and then private equity is something that we've talked to you about in the past, and it's, uh, we've decided not to invest in it historically for, for good reasons, uh, but we'll talk about it again today. There are a couple other asset categories we're going to talk to you about that we can include in other areas in, in other ways in your portfolio in the future, notably uh, things like private credit and um, global equity. So um, when we um, talk about actually implementing within each asset class, we can put those in as opposed to modeling it globally in an asset liability study. Okay. Okay. So does that make sense, what we're trying to do today? Okay, great. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Claire, and she's going to walk through the different asset categories. So we'll start on page one of the presentation, uh, which summarizes most of what Greg just went through. Um, as you know, your current strategic target has allocations to U.S. equity, non-U.S. equity, so public equity within U.S. and non-U.S., uh, U.S. intermediate fixed income, and domestic real estate. As Greg mentioned, you talked a lot about uh, considering additional private real assets in August. So we'll revisit that a little bit, but you've already gone through and weeded out, kind of narrowed it down to um, infrastructure as the alternative real asset that might make the most sense for your portfolio. So we haven't spent a bunch of time on timber, agriculture, or uh, public real assets in this presentation. And moving on to slide two, this chart is one that we pulled out of your quarterly investment performance report. Uh, Greg talked about how we put the performance of your plan and the asset allocation of your plan uh, in the context of what other public plans do. You don't have to look the same as them by any means, uh, but it does help inform your performance versus other, other plans' performance by looking at your strategic target versus theirs. What do you, uh, theirs, what do you invest in that uh, other plans also invest in? Uh, what do you invest in that other plans don't? Uh, what other asset categories do other plans invest in that you don't? So that's summarized on this chart on slide two. Um, so the left-hand side shows the asset classes that you do invest in, uh, and in the orange box are the asset categories that we're gonna walk through today ones that you do not invest in. What's most notable to me uh, on this chart is that the bottom line, which shows the percentage of the group invested. So we've pulled that through um, as we talk about <coughs> each individual asset category, but those that you do invest in are ones that most other public plans do as well. Those that you don't 
are less common. Um, so 11 to 30 or 40 percent of public plans invest in these other asset categories. Looking at slide three, just laying out the asset categories that we're going to walk through, again, at a very high level. Uh, we are more than happy to go into additional detail on others that you're more interested in at a later meeting or as, as best as we can today. Um, but starting with non-U.S. fixed income. So about 16% of other plans invest in non-U.S. fixed income. That does fall under the broader category of fixed income overall, so we would be looking to that asset, cl asset class to be a risk mitigator within the portfolio. Under the broader bucket of alternatives, we'll look at private credit, hedge funds, and multi-asset class strategies. So private, uh, private credit would be a growth-oriented asset class, uh, hedge funds and multi-asset class strategies, looking to them as diversifying, so a different type of return stream that could feed into the total portfolio. Private equity, generally an extension of equity, uh, and then other real assets, we'll look at infrastructure, which you've heard a fair amount about already, uh, as well as commodities, which would be more of an inflation protection focused asset class. And then lastly, we'll talk a bit about global equity. We think of global equity as more of an implementation, uh, more of an implementation consideration, less of a, a separate asset class. You have allocations to public equity, uh, both in U.S. and non-U.S. flavors. Um, but looking at it from a global perspective would be a manager that's taking a, a more macro top-down view versus implementing in regional silos as you do. So we'll talk a bit about that as well. Starting with non-U.S. fixed income. Slides five and six kind of set the stage of why we have fixed income in the portfolio at all. Uh, so M. Sarah is a total return investor. You land in this middle category here of public pension plans with uh, top Hartley plans, corporate pension plans, endowments, foundations, looking to your fixed income portfolio for diversification. Uh, it is meant to be a flight to quality asset class, so a deflation hedge. Uh, it should provide some liquidity uh, and can provide some additional return. I think slide six does a good job of demonstrating the role of fixed income in the portfolio. So looking at uh, the returns of the Bloomberg Barclays aggregate, which is the U.S. fixed income, which is the allocation that you have, um, versus the S&P 500 index performance in declining equity periods. So whenever the S&P 500 has been negative, when the S&P 500 goes down, fixed income has served as your effective flight to quality, and it's done a good job of that. Uh, most recently, just in the fourth quarter, that last bar on the far right shows just the fourth quarter of 2018. We saw the S&P 500 sink 14% just in that one quarter, and your bond allocation was positive. So consistently serving that flight to quality allocation. So why would we add non-U.S. fixed income? Uh, I guess quickly on slide seven, this is a, a good snapshot. I have a question. Yes. Uh, before we go to leave up page, page six. So it, it looks like in the past, um, there was, as the market dropped um, significantly, there was a more significant correlation with the bond revenues going up. In the last three quarters, it is, or the last three examples anyway, although it, bond revenues go up a little bit, they don't go up all that much. So they seem to counterbalance the drop in, in the stocks to a lesser extent than they did in the past. So is there any thought on why that's the case? I think there are a couple uh, things going on. One is um, from 2010 to 18, that's all post-global financial crisis, where interest rates had already fallen to really low levels. So the amount of extra juice you get from falling interest rates and their interest rates don't have as far to fall um, because they're already low. Um, so there's, it's not as powerful as it, it has been in the past when interest rates were higher. Uh, so that's part of it. Um, but the other thing is that the, uh, the blue bars are almost always going to be smaller than the green bars. Fixed income is just a less uh, volatile asset class than equities. Um, 
and uh, but because interest rates have come down, is they've become even less of a diversifier, if you if you will. Greg, does it matter that those last three examples are also relatively shorter time frames? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah, there's not the a <clears throat> compounding effect of the multiple time period. Yeah, that's a good. Point. I mean, I think the interest rate is the probably the largest explanatory yeah. factor there. That we're already in depressed interest rates and <clears throat> bonds can't, I mean, rates can't go much lower. So, yeah. isn't it a simple axiom that, you know, when stocks go down, money comes out of the market and goes into fixed income, <coughs> which then lowers interest rates, which increases the yield on your, it sounds funny, but when interest rates go down, you make money because yeah. the, the daily value, the mark to market of yeah. your bond goes up. Yeah. So, that's kind of the day-to-day yep. -day thing. And there's only one exception on this period, and that's 1994, mm -hmm. where interest rate, where stocks and bonds were both down at the same time, and that's because the recession was caused by the Fed increasing interest rates. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that is the one exception. Mm -hmm. And it bring it up because that's what people worry about today, that the Federal Reserve's increasing interest rates will call it, cause a recession, which will cause stock prices to go down. Um, so, uh, yeah, but every other time period, the bond market's been up when the stock market's been down for the reason that you, you talk about money moving from one asset category to the other. Any other questions? So a quick snapshot of the Bloomberg Barclays aggregate is on slide seven. Um, again, we're looking to this allocation to provide diversification, stability, and income, uh, which it has done historically. Now these are high quality investment grade US bonds. What's not in there are high yield bonds or anything international, so emerging market debt uh, or developed market debt. So why would we consider investing in international bonds? Uh, the main reason is for diversification. So exposure to different economies and different currencies. Now there are certainly considerations that come with that, um, but the question is, do you want that? Do you want to add that to your fixed income portfolio? Claire? Yes. You've got some acronyms on that page. Would you walk us through those? Yes. CMBS, RBS? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so those are mortgage-backed securities. CMBS would be commercial mortgage-backed securities. Uh, RMBS, residential mortgage-backed securities. Okay, thank you. Those are the ones thank that, you for the question. that uh, S and P uh, and said were just great, the greatest thing in the world. Uh, only ten years ago, right? Well, though, uh, they could have been, but uh, the. Index providers, so the person who creates this index, Bloomberg Barclays, it used to be Lehman, and before that, Shearson Lehman, and Shearson, um, they have always screened out the, um, what were the problematic mortgages. So the index was always Fannie Mae, Freddie Mae, Jenny Mae, Passive Mortgages. Um, they always, so this sliver always did well. Now, what was, the financial engineering that created the uh, subprime mortgages aren't in this index, but they wound up in portfolios anyway. So these were the lower tranches. Now uh, these these are the um, uh, on the on the uh, RMBS. Yeah. So this is uh, agency <coughs> RBS. These are Fannie Freddie pass through mortgages, um, and they're no tranches. They're like the pass-through mortgages, and then what people would do is they would, they could take mortgages and slice them up into things called CMOs, and then they would have different tranches, if you will. But what these are, are tranches. So, <laughs> like a layered cake. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, they they're um, engineered mortgages. Um, it's probably the. That's the way to put it. I like the way the treasuries and the RMBS are different shades of blue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, shades of the same color. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, these are um, implicitly backed by the government. All the uh, Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny. Yeah. Ginny's Ginny. Ginny are explicitly backed, and Fannie and Freddie are explicitly, implicitly backed. Um, 
So the credit quality is good, but the problem with mortgages is not will you get paid back money, it's when will you get paid back money in a, in a standard residential mortgage backed security. So all of you are homeowners, if you're with a Fannie or Freddie mortgage, you have the ability to prepay or not prepay your mortgage. Right? And so the question is timing when you get back the money, not so much will you get back the money. In these, now that other other stuff that went sour in 07 or later, you know, those are subprime mortgages, different animals, not in this index. So what we're showing here on page seven is what you have today. Your portfolios are benchmarked to this. Your active managers can invest in things not in this index, and they do. Um, but this is the general exposure for your bond portfolio today. And what we're looking at here with international fixed income is, oh, maybe we should add, add some different bonds, international bonds, and what's the pros and cons of it. So we talked a bit about the pros. We'll go into more detail there. Um, key pro is diversification, and again, uh, exposure to different economies, uh, different interest rates, different currencies. Mm -hmm. um, but the big question is, do you want that? Um, so key cons are that interest rates are quite low for international bonds. Um, yields are low and currency can be quite volatile. Um, so we're not pushing for you to add international bonds to your portfolio, uh, but about 16% of public plan sponsors do have an allocation to international bonds. When used, uh, the allocation is typically about 4% of the total portfolio for public plans. Claire? The, uh Global bond index, can you talk to us about the because I hear a lot about emerging market debt. That seems to have been a hot topic lately, and I know almost nothing about it. How much of the index is emerging market debt versus developed market, and is there a significant difference between those two? And I'm assuming the index you're showing us here is just the aggregate. Is that so? A lot of things to, to unpack in there. It is. It should be largely developed market debt. Um, do you know the answer to percentage? Yeah. Uh, so the, the index we're looking at here is developed market, global ag, XUS. Okay. Uh, and um, emerging market debt is its own beast. If you look at it globally, it's not a big percent. Because think of how much issuance is the U.S. Treasury, Japan, I mean, huge issuers of debt. And then you have, you know, Mexico, so, um, China, they're actually in the aggregate. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the, the um, criteria to get into the aggregate is uh, being $250 million in issuance, AAA rated, US dollar denominated, issued in the United States. So you have some countries who actually put the, their debt in the United States, are willing to pay US dollar, and it will wind up in this index. And then you get the countries who don't do that. Um, and then they would be in something like the NB index or the ELMI index. And that's different from what we're looking at here. What we're looking at here today is the non-US fixed income developed market. And you'll see at the bottom of page eight, the yield is incredibly low. The yield's 1%. Mm -hmm. And the US yield, um, what's the effective data? This, three and a quarter? Yeah. So, should be, yeah. So the US <coughs> yields are 2% higher than international yields. And this is because yields in Europe are so low and yields in Japan are so incredibly low. And those are the big issuers. So to go out and get international bonds that really yield anything close to US, you've actually got to take a substantial amount of risk in terms of country and currency risk. And that's why we're not big fans of international uh, fixed income. About um, yeah. Just real quickly, you saying that, and I know this is a projection, it's not really, I mean, it's looking out in the future, probably through your rear view mirror, but why would anybody look at this and ever invest in non-U.S. 
fixed. Uh, I mean, like you just said, the, yeah. the return is low and the risk is high. Yeah. Why? It became, it was, frankly, it was a fad. Our industry goes through fads and trends. Mm -hmm. And this was a fad five to ten years ago. And it was propelled by a, a belief that, okay, U.S. rates are so low, yields are so low, and they're destined to go up. But I still need to invest in bonds, so give me a different bond to invest in. And people looked around the world, and they said, oh, I'm going to go into global. I'm going to go into international bonds. A lot of people did. Um, and it's something that we, you know, Callan, we've never pushed a lot. Because we're like, well, the yields are so low, why would you do it? But the argument for uh, getting out of the U.S. Treasury was so strong that it pushed people into international fixed income. Well, the, the worst was in the early 80s, late 70s, when Mexico, Argentina, and yeah. Brazil were the hot, hot tickets at like 3 and 4% interest when prime here was 10 Mm -hmm. And it was all driven by government policy to push money into these other countries. And so you, you have these rates in foreign countries that are driven by government fiat. They're not mm -hmm. market forces. The interest rates in Europe are so low because the European Central Bank has, you know, blown their balance sheet up to right. monumental levels. That's right. And then I think the tenure in Germany went negative again. Well, it's negative again. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, it's okay. it's uh, the I mean they're they're incredibly uh, low yields right now, and so that's the developed markets that I just mentioned. But you're mentioning emerging economies, and with emerging economies, you worry about if they have the ability to pay you back, but also the willingness. And at some time, I mean, they're sovereign entities, and they could just say no. <laughs> right. Uh, right, or Argentina. Argentina is historically, they, the issue with them is their willingness to pay you back, not their ability to pay you back. So, I think Argentina's gone belly up on their bonds something like 12 times yeah. in history. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So, so anyone so want to invest in international <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to increase the risk profile of the overall fixed income composite, which we don't continue to do. So, if, if I may, Madam sure. Chair, why is emerging market debt so popular? Um, so, uh, EMD is distinct from what we're looking at here today, and um, I think emerging debt is just seeking yield. Okay. Just seeking an extra yield relative to what you can get in the U.S. Treasury market right now. So it's it's simply adding risk yes. to chase yield. Yes. Yeah. And it's that. Yes. And importantly, yeah. your bond managers have the ability to tactically allocate to that if they think it's a good investment dis, uh, opportunity for you. So your PIMCO and Dodge and Cox, if they think Mexican debt is really cheap, they can invest in it for you. They'll, they'll only invest this much in it, um, but they can do it, and they can do it on your behalf. Uh, I, and get, based on our point of view, we think that's a better way to implement them for you to make a strategic dis, uh, decision to allocate to EMD. Or not to. Or not to, that's right. yeah, right. Okay, uh, slide 10 basically tells you that we think if you invested in international bonds, we think active management would be uh, a good implementation of that allocation. Uh, and 11 shows some historical performance. Let's move on to alternative investments. So we'll start with private credit. You've talked about private equity, uh, so private equity implementation, private credit, similar idea, but private issuing private debt. Uh, so the role of private credit in your portfolio would be growth. Um, it is typically viewed as a complement to a traditional fixed income program, not a replacement. It is a, gro a growth allocation. It is credit sensitive though, obviously. Uh, there has been a fair amount of interest in private credit among institutional investors. 
uh, because we've been in a prolonged low interest rate environment um, and it's driven many investors searching for yield. How do we boost yield in our portfolio? Um, overall, what is private credit? It's privately, uh, privately negotiated non-traded debt. So this does not trade over the counter. Uh, it is like private equity, it is privately traded. Um, there are two product markets where development has been institutional. So you would not be issuing debt directly, uh, but you could invest in products that focus, one, on direct lending, so making loans to small and medium-sized businesses, or two, uh, institutional products that focus on private real estate debt. So those are kind of two different flavors of private credit uh, that many institutional investors are investing in. That's the way that they're gaining access. There are significant risks uh, to investing in private credit as well, though. Um, the opportunity set there is highly fragmented. So when you look at different opportunities to invest in private credit, they don't all look the same. Um, they will look different from each other. Uh, but as we take a step back and think about why investors are putting money to work there, um, one of our concerns is that a, a high focus on yield um, could push investors toward a higher risk allocation than they realize is there. So an equity like risk um, when you're looking for a more income oriented investment. Right, Claire? Yes. It seems when you look at, at private debt and, and you're, you're mixing uh, bitter and sweet in the same pot. And, and you go to the bank and you've got the commercial real estate side and you've got the uh, business lending side and they are totally different animals one is highly risky it's if the founder of the company gets hit in a car accident or some other terrible thing his kids uh, got into SC uh, illicitly <laughs> uh, you know your your credit goes down the tubes and the other is real estate which is you're lending a fraction of the overall value so they're, they're completely different animals, and I, I personally, you know, having been in one side of that, I don't like them lumped together. Because one is, is highly risky, and the other is has a very low risk. Uh, yeah, so we can, we're trying to describe them in two different pieces. One is the private credit, and then the other is the private real estate uh, debt. And to your point, a lot of times the, the debt on real estate is collateralized by something. There's a property there. And in many cases with private credit, there can be uh, some, something secure in the loan. Um, if you're a manufacturer, there's property plant equipment and, and that sort of thing in, in the private credit side. Um, in both of these situations, um, we, if you wanted to invest in private, direct lending credit, so you're lending money to a corporation of some, some sort, you would want to hire someone who underwrites those investments appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, you know, most... It's hard to do. Mm -hmm. it's, Underwriting business loans is very hard to do. It's very hard. And it's... Um, um, so why, why is it perked up? Uh, well, there's, uh, I talked about trends going through the market, and a lot of times there's like one big theme that people catch on, and it kind of pushes this trend forward. So the theme of EMD and international fixed income is U.S. rates are so low, what else can I invest in? <clears throat> What's driving people to invest in private credit is the idea that um, you have these small and mid-sized companies who um, used to go to a bank and take loans from the bank. And then the, and that would be the relationship. And I would lend money to uh, the bank, right? And now there's this disintermediation going on where you, the asset owners, you, aren't lending Bank of America money, who then lends it to someone else. Instead, you're going somehow straight to the company. And uh, so the one idea is you're cutting out the middleman bank of America. 
But the other idea is that Bank of America or other banks have smaller balance sheets with uh, regulation post-2008. Post they don't have as much capital. Uh, they don't have the ability to make those loans anymore. Mm -hmm. So the idea is there's this demand out there for these small and mid-sized companies to borrow money. And how, do we, how does capital get to them? Uh, one thing about being an asset owner is that philosophically what you're doing is that you're, um, you're deploying capital to parts of the mark, to parts of the industry or the economy that need capital, right? And you get paid money back by doing that. You deploy money to the U.S. Treasury for bonds, to corporate America. You buy stocks. That's what you're doing is you're giving capital to people in, in the areas that are efficient. And with private credit, the idea is, well, we're still doing that, but we're going to small and mid-sized companies that can't borrow from big banks anymore uh, for those reasons. So that's the big kind of philosophical, or, you know, industry trend thing that's pushing people in this area. Um, but what's wrong with it? Well, it's, very, it's really hard to implement. You, know, there, you, need to, you need to hire someone who knows how to I'd identify and underwrite these small and mid-sized companies. Um, on top of that, it's just uh, they're riskier. You know, they're riskier investments. Um, well, before you you invested in Bank of America and they had 50 loans, now you have one loan, or you have a collection of loans, and there's no one in between. So that person in between before used to mitigate the risk for you. Other questions? Uh, implementing private credit would be an illiquid investment, um, which is certainly another implementation concern um, or consideration. Uh, and as Greg alluded to, it's important to pick a good manager, and most of the managers have pretty short track records. Um, so that's certainly a challenge, uh, as most have unproven. So what is what are you seeing as returns of people you collect? I don't think we have returns in here. There'll be a, a, a couple percentage point premium over in, in public investment grade bonds. Okay. And just out of curiosity, is there an average issue size for a, a, a debt? I mean, it's a, like a whole lot of six figures, a whole lot of eight figures? Uh, it would be in the millions, but it would be, it wouldn't be a hundred million, um, unless it's some large buyout sort of thing. Um, and, but it, it'd be $50 million loans. And that sounds like a big number to us, but that's, it's pretty small, All right? right? If, so, full disclosure, in my uh, prior gig, uh, we did some, I don't know if it was truly considered private credit, but it was through PIMCO. We did some of the Discos and the Bravos, mm -hmm. uh, which were private, I, I always thought of them as private credit funds. They were buyout opportunities. These were the, you know, it was post uh, global financial crisis. They were getting good opportunities and PIMCO had the scale obviously to do that and those funds if memory serves um, they were very illiquid um, but at the end of the day I think we were getting I want to say it was seven eight percent across a number of those funds are those in this space or is that something totally different um, I'm, I'm not reconciling in my head I think they could they could be, and I say could because Disco was distressed, distressed uh, credit opportunities. Yeah, right. And that first word is the key word. Distressed. And that, and it's opportunistic. Right. Like it, it went in post oh eight oh nine and said, these people are desperate and they're giving me these huge yields, and it's it was an opportunistic investment, as opposed to something that's just an ongoing. Um, 
uh, investment. Um, so Disco was um, was distressed and opportunistic. Bravo, I think the B of Bravo was banks. It, I, it was it was buying uh, mortgages and asset backs from banks who were. Um, Shrinking their balance sheets. Okay. They were they were vulture capitalists who were, like free who were instead. stealing, who were stealing bank portfolios because of regulation <laughs> and, and were squeezing the borrowers. It was the most immoral. There were some real horrible people in that business. Milken? No, this yeah. was after Milken. Milken. But that kind of a deal. No, it was insider, the Bass Brothers. You know. Who, Rather than the, the government go to these banks and say, "Well, you have you have too many loans on your on your balance sheet. You have to you have to get rid of those loans." And so the banks would call the borrowers and they they would squeeze the borrowers to pay off. And if they couldn't get the borrowers to pay off, then they would sell off these loans at big discounts to like the Bass Brothers, who would then call up so that the Bass Brothers buy the loan at like fifty cents on the dollar. And they'd call up the borrower and say, well, if you pay us off in 90 days, we'll give you a 20% discount on the note. Yeah. And they'd make this huge spread all at, you know, at everybody else's prop, you know, loss. Yeah. It, was just, it was just terrible. I mean, Dodd-Frank just set up pirates. And Dodd-Frank, I mean, in my business, we always say, God bless Dodd-Frank, because it put the banks out of business. Yeah and made tremendous opportunities for shadow banking. Exactly, yeah. And so, what Bravo, so Bravo was also another example of an opportunistic investment in that the banks were forced to shrink their balance sheets. And institutional investors like yourselves came in and invested where there was that um, void. Um, so, but we're not in that era right now. It's not a distressed era. Right. So it's not, that doesn't seem to, that's not an argument why you would do it today instead of like a long term policy today. I will owe, so when we do an asset liability study, this is the sort of mentality like I will always be in this asset category for, for these reasons because I think they're um, you know, long term perpetual benefits of being in that asset class. Well, I think, I think the distressed debt is washed out. That, that's gone through its cycle, but mm -hmm. still the banks are like, you know, they're, they're like sharks in a tank with one fin tied behind their backs. They, they <laughs> want to make loans, they've yeah. got money, and Dodd-Frank has still got them constrained in what they can do. Right. And so they're sending loans out to the private sector brokers and saying, here's the best customer in the world, we love them, they've been the greatest guy on the planet, but regulation X can't we can't make this guy alone, and we don't want to send him down the road to another bank because then they'll pick, yeah. they'll pick off his business relationship, which, yeah. which where the money is. Right. So will you, private lender, make him this loan, and then you know in a couple of years uh, when he, things change, we'll, we'll we'll come back and take this customer back from you. Mm -hmm. right. And so there's there's a lot of opportunities along that that line that still exist. Right. It's just finding the the sources to do that are extremely limited. Yeah. So you have to find those those niche. They're kind of like uh, private equity guys, except in the lending <coughs> space. Yes. But the yields, you know, you can make five, six percent on that stuff. That is high quality loans, not you know, not risky loans. Right. But you know, fifty, sixty percent loan to value loans. Right. Yeah. So it so uh, in the direct lending area to credit, that's one category <clears throat> where you could be making those loans to companies, and then the other one on page fifteen is uh, real estate. So within your real estate portfolio, you could have a uh, a manager who manages debt within real estate specifically, um, and. Uh, but it, that comes with the same caveats about finding someone who can identify these opportunities and dealing with the illiquidity associated with it. Did 
you have anything else on real estate debt? Or? Uh, I mean, I think that's a good summary of it. Um, it makes sense that there are uh, opportunities for private real estate debt. Right? So real estate is certainly a capital intensive asset class um, and a borrower uh, would you certainly be interested in, in flexible lending parameters which they could get through private real estate debt. Um, as a lender, you would again be seeking higher yields than on publicly traded debt. Um, but as Greg mentioned, there are considerations of illiquidity. Uh, you need to find the right manager, so due diligence is, is very important. <coughs> illiquidity is one of the benefits that we have as long-term investors, and that's why we get to make a higher return on our money, because we don't need liquidity, especially if you're talking in a sector that's 5% of our, 5 to 10 percent of our portfolio, and we're going to lock up on 5, 10, 15, 20 year loans. We get the benefit of being able to do that. Of course, you know, personally, I'm going to die in so many years, and I, I want to make sure my kids get the money, you know, or I'm going to be able to spend it before then. Right. Yep. So illiquidity is a benefit for us. Yeah, it is. You know, we listed under considerations, um, but I think that more means that you just need to have conviction across the horizon of the fund. Yeah. What are you saying? Markets are becoming fully priced. Spreads are tight. Okay. You, uh, so the. Um, the uh, all the. Uh, Fiscal stimulus or monetary stimulus we've had has driven down yields and prices up. So the opportunities in real estate debt aren't the same what they were when we were talking about Disco and Bravo before. Um, it's more of an income market now than an appreciation market. Right. So income market means you make your coupon. It's not that you're you're going to get a lot of appreciation from holding that uh, investment. So it seems like this might be the <coughs> sort of category that uh, Lee's talked about in the past, where he's talked about investment opportunities that he's running across in his um, private sector. Um, but then uh, the consideration for us would be, you know, if. if the vast majority of the money that goes into this fund is from the local. <coughs> um, I mean, there's state, federal, of course, but um, that we don't want to put all of our eggs in the Mendocino County basket. So we yeah. want to have the diversification. Um, but I keep thinking that couldn't there be like an alliance of like 1937 out counties in California, um, some in Southern California, some in the Silicon Valley, where um, uh, we're sort of investing in other areas of the state. At, or at least as a pool, so that we don't have much risk in any one county. Um, but if we had, um, you know, some people like the Lees of the world who kind of knew of these lenders who, who for any number of reasons just can't make the loan, even though it's a good loan, or don't right. want to make the entire of the capital. Um, but we could then, if we could get four or five percent return um, after expenses and and display some of our lower yield returns, some of our cash. It just seems like that that may be a better model. I mean, I, I, I like that spreading out that risk throughout California rather than just in Minnesota County. I, I suspect, for example, that a local bank that is only in one county it can be more conservative than a, a bank that's in multiple states in, say, in mortgages or whatever, just because what happens in one region um, economically doesn't really distress their portfolio. Right. Fires, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in management of this, I mean, I just think of housing in California as something that needs to be built. There's going to be housing developers that need money. Is this the type where you have to pick a manager that knows those developers or has worked with those? Or how does this set up? If you pick a manager to do this, what will you understand? That about what they're going to do, or can you direct them, say, big housing developers? So with um, real estate debt, <clears throat> you, um, let's say you took your, you've got about half a billion dollars, say 10% in real estate, and let's say you put, so that's 50 million, and then you 
put a fifth of that in real estate, yeah. you start getting down to the five to ten million dollars that you would ever actually allocate to real estate debt. So it's not enough money for you to build a diversified portfolio on your own. You would have to invest in a fund that's up and running or as Dan mentioned, something like something that I don't know if it exists of, um, you know, on the, the uh, 47 Act funds getting together to do that. Um, so to invest in a existing fund, um, I don't know of any that it invest exclusively in California. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they might, in <coughs> so what they would do is they would then invest in uh, a suites of real estate that might include commercial real estate and not just <coughs> housing real estate, residential mm -hmm. real estate. Um, some of the debt, I, you know, like the Toll Brothers of the world, they don't necessarily need to go to this market. They're a public company. They can issue debt to build their houses. Mm -hmm. They're a corporation. Uh, this would be a different animal than that. Can I move it? You don't want to make construction loans. That construction loans, are, that, that's a very risky business. And you don't want to make home loans. That's an extremely risky business. Uh, even in the, through the private sector, uh, now it used to take 90 days to foreclose on a house. Now it takes 69 months. Uh, the protect the homeowner has created an environment where now the homeowner is in real trouble. <laughs> you can't borrow money. A lot of people can't borrow money because they're so protected that nobody will lend them money. So uh, private money in, in residential or construction, not a good thing. The, the, the best area is you know, commercial construction office buildings um, and industrial and uh, farmland at different ag, ag types. And multifamily. And multifamily, yeah. Um, but uh, full disclosure, I, I'm retired from a mortgage company that I own. You know, I've been in the business for 45 years. Yeah. And, uh, Funds, uh, I've, I've always been very opposed to mortgage funds that are run <coughs> by the people who create the pool. Because you, in, in banking, you, you have two people. You have the, the hunters and the skinners. You have the people who go out and get the loans and work directly with the borrowers, and they get a commission. They get a bonus. So they, they have a, a motivation to go out and get the business. And then you've got the, 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 the Skinners inside, the, the, the senior management that makes the decisions, and they're on salary and they don't get bonuses. So if you can find a fund where you have the Hunters and the Skinners, and the Skinners are overlooking, you know, they, you have a great situation. Um, and we have, right, Parker Mortgage has a fund. It's really interesting with a, a, an international church there with their, with their uh, uh, trust department that they have like $100 million worth of loans in this pool that's overrun, that's overseen by the church. And their members and their institutions within can put money into that pool. And so it's their pool, they run it, they manage it, and Parker Mortgage provides all the loans for it. So it's, a, it's an interesting, it w that's the kind of thing that would work for state. If you got a bunch of, a few pension plans together, uh, that would work. The, the hardest part in the mortgage business is if you allocated 10 or 20 million dollars, you have to give the, the purveyor time to fill that that portfolio right and the problem too with with private secondary lending not secondary but primary lending is the loans pay off if you're charging more than the banks um, you, your your portfolio turns over more and when it's not out you're, you're getting you know 
three quarters of a percent on your money versus five, five and a half percent on your money. So those are some of the considerations. But yeah. You would need someone to always manage it. Yeah, and, and, and at, at a company like Parker Mortgage, um, Parker Klein Mortgage, you know, you know the, the average loan is about $2 million. So, and, and you have to, you have to make loans that are a certain size that, that within the small loan category under a million dollars, there's a lot of competition. A lot of mom and pops can, you know, one or two mom and pops can make a million dollar loan. Right. So you get up to two million and up, that that takes the mom and pops out of the market and, and then it's find somebody with a deep pocket like ours who can go, yeah, two million up, great. Any other questions about the, on the private debt side? Okay. Let's move on to hedge funds. We've got hedge, fund, hedge funds and multi-asset class strategies within alternatives, yeah. So hedge funds uh, and also multi-asset class strategies play a different role in the portfolio, uh, and which is diversifying assets. So these are alpha-oriented strategies. They don't have clear benchmarks. Um, they don't have market-oriented benchmarks, and they're largely reliant on manager skill. Um, so they can employ a variety of different strategies. They involve short selling, leverage, derivatives. Uh, hedge funds are illiquid. Um, they have a different fee structure than public equity or public fixed income. Um, and there are different flavors of hedge funds. So hedge funds is kind of a catch-all category, uh, but implementation and again, manager skill is what determines the ultimate outcome. You would invest either via fund of funds or a direct fund. Um, so kind of two different categories, but both are private placement vehicles. Not something that's readily available to the public. The goal of having a, of a hedge fund allocation is going to be to achieve a high risk adjusted return. So we're not looking to hedge funds to outperform Public equity, uh, we expect a return between equity and bonds, uh, but with a lower volatility than public equity. Now, hedge funds have been disappointing. Um, we have been in a strong bull market, a strong beta market, and so hedge funds have not delivered um, higher risk-adjusted returns than just long-only equity, which has been a substantial part of your portfolio. Why are they illiquid? because they have illiquid investments underneath. Um, so one challenge of hedge funds is that there can be limited transparency into the actual holdings, um, but the actual holdings of theirs can have longer lockup periods and, and less liquidity there. And also because you invest in a partnership. So if you go out and you hire XYZ hedge fund, you're putting money into a, like a little partnership there and they tell you when you're allowed to take money from back from them. And it, so they all have different rules. It might be 30-day notice, it might be 60-day notice, it might be one-year notice sort of thing. And it depends on every, every fund is different and it's based on what strategy they're employing. So a standard long-short equity fund, they're just buying stocks and going long and short. And in theory, you should be able to get the money back relatively quickly, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, you're investing in this other partnership where um, they can put up a gate and then they could regulate the flow of the money uh, to and from. Thank you. So why would you invest in hedge funds? Uh, hedge funds should have a low correlation to traditional asset classes. Um, they should provide, there's a potential to provide higher risk adjusted <coughs> returns. Um, however, they are less liquid, uh, they do have higher fees, so the fee structure is different. Um, they can include incentive fees, so the typical 2 and 20 that you may hear, um, it's a 20% incentive fee over net profits is, is a typical structure. Um, and they can have leverage risk, so because they can go short, any potential for magnified gains could be magnified losses as well. Um, we have our Calen capital market projections for hedge funds listed alongside the 
broad asset classes that you do invest in at the bottom. Um, our projected return for hedge funds is about 5.5% over the trailing 10 years or forward-looking 10 years. Um, so how do we come up with that? It's, it's a return between our stock and bond estimates. Um, again, hedge funds have not delivered, so we have actual performance on slide 18. And we compare the hedge fund to fund group versus a balanced 60-40 portfolio. So if you were to invest in 60% public equity, 40% bonds, how has that done versus a hedge fund allocation? Uh, and over the last 5, 10, 15 years, it has strongly outperformed. That's the blue dot versus the gray distribution represents the actual performance of a hedge fund peer group. Now, could I bring something up real quick please. since we're talking about that? Uh, last month we had a report from CEM. Yes, CEM benchmarking. What does it stand for? I don't, I don't know. Don't remember. <laughs> and they had a summary. Um, you can improve your fund's performance by adopting the following four characteristics of top performing investment plan sponsors. Do not use funds of funds. Do not invest in hedge funds. <laughs> If your fund has less than $10 billion in assets, use pu public market alternatives to private equity and unlisted real estate and index efficient asset classes such as U.S. large uh, cap stocks. How does all that mix in with what you're telling us today? And I think this was a study we paid for. No, no, no. That was a presentation at the Calipers Conference. Okay. And they look at a lot of different pension funds across the U.S. and Canada. This isn't the one where we answered questions? No, no, no. no. Okay. That, was, that was a different way. So uh, all of that would say don't invest in hedge funds, right? Mm -hmm. So um, okay. it's, this is not an asset category we're advocating for for you. And fund of funds? Well, so fund of funds is the only <clears throat> practical way for you to invest in that category. So it's to me it's a, a decision tree. Do you invest in hedge funds? And I, I'm guessing you're probably just going to say no categorically. But let's say you said yes. We would then say, well, if then you could either go direct and have very concentrated investments in one or two hedge funds or have a diversified fund-to-fund -fund strategy. And if you want to be in hedge funds, we would advocate fund-to-funds for you. Um, but I don't think we need to even get that far down the tree um, to, to, to get there. Um, I, so I, I did uh, see that uh, um, study, and that's the one thing I, uh, I, I did disagree with a couple things in it. And one of it is you know, cer certain investors, you just need a fund to fund. If you, if you want to go in a certain category, you need that to give you the diversification. It's not necessarily to give you the highest return, but it, it's more of a diversification implementation point. So it's, uh, uh, we've talked about hedge funds in the past, and there's, uh, I don't think it lines up well with the philosophy statement that we just approved as well. So there's a different group of investments uh, that we also have talked to you about and their uh, multi-asset class strategies, MAC strategies. And they came about, you know, we're talking about waves going through the industry. Okay, if, if I want to invest in something that is uncorrelated to the markets, and I don't like hedge funds because they're not transparent and they're expensive, what else could I do? And that's where these MAC strategies come in. And we actually talked to you about them a couple of years ago, uh, but we'll kind of briefly touch on them here again. So if you like the differentiated return stream, the idea of focus on risk-adjusted returns, but you don't like the illiquidity and other things that Greg mentioned about hedge funds, um, multi-asset class strategies, we call it bridging the gap between traditional long-only uh, and hedge funds. So like hedge funds, uh, they are kind of a catch-all category. There's lots of different flavors of multi-asset class strategies. They are benchmark agnostic. Um, they can invest across multiple asset classes. Uh, they can be outcome-oriented. Uh, 
So a different approach to investing than the traditional asset classes that you use. Um, like hedge funds, they can have leverage, they can short, they can use derivatives, uh, they can shift capital between asset classes, but like traditional long-only investments, uh, they do have a flat fee, uh, tend to be lower fees, and they are highly liquid and transparent. Uh, they are a newer product set, as Greg mentioned, so track records tend to be short. Uh, they should provide diversification from equity, equity and bonds. They can provide downside protection in a bear equity market, uh, but they will typically lag in an up equity market, in a strong bull market, which is what we've seen. Um, they can have many different applications. Again, if this was a path that you chose to go down, we would talk a lot more about the different flavors of multi-asset class strategies, what kind do you want. They can have very... Um, varied risk return profiles. Uh, they have had very ris uh, varied risk return profiles and, and selecting a, a good manager is always um, a key risk. Any questions there? So they should provide a, a strong risk adjusted return but that downside protection is surely not guaranteed. I get the sense that there is not an appetite to go <laughs> down that direction, so I think we'll move on. Are there any questions in the meantime? If not, we'll skip to private equity. Okay, so private equity on slide 23. This is an asset category that I believe you all have talked about uh, a lot in the past. Um, the role of private equity within the total portfolio construct is growth, uh, so it is equity. Um, there should be an illiquidity premium that you receive, so it should private equity should outperform public equity over the long term, and it has. Uh, we'll see that on the next page. Um, while it is viewed as a separate asset class, it would be modeled separately within your asset liability study, it is really an extension of equity. Um, there are a few regulatory disclosure requirements with private equity. It requires a much longer investment horizon because it is illiquid. So thinking 10 to 15 years, typically. Um, and fees are higher than trade, uh, publicly traded equity. The key goal is to achieve returns in excess of public equity. And private equity funds have generally done that. So on slide 23, we have some historical performance. Uh, historically, private equity has outperformed longer stocks by approximately 6% over 20 years. As Lee mentioned, you do, have, uh, you do have the ability to lock up capital, to invest in illiquid strategies, uh, and potentially take advantage of the, the illiquidity premium that we would expect out of private equity. CalPERS recently made a lot of noise in around private equity with their decision to transition all of their private equity program in-house. Can you, what was behind that and what does that really mean for the private equity landscape as, as an investor considering moving in that direction? I haven't, I haven't been following that closely. They, so they have, are, um, I know that they're trying to, um, come up with more key strategic number of relationships, like shrink the number of relationships, as opposed to having, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of partnerships they had in the past. Um, is that what you're alluding to, or was it, is it? Um, I, I thought the announcement was that they were going to bring the entire plan in-house for their private equity program. Um, oh, and so there, I, I, I haven't been, I don't know that. Maybe I misunderstood. Yeah, no, and, and you know, I don't work with them, so okay. I, I don't, I don't know. Um, Maybe don't know. you'd be willing to share that article today. Okay. Brian. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. and it, it and uh, you know, our private equity guys would know more about what's going on with that than I do. I, I just personally don't have uh, any knowledge of it. And it may be that I'm misremembering and confusing yeah. a couple of things. So yeah, that's not entirely possible. The um, but one one thing, if you're a real large investor like them, is uh, how do you put that much money to work? And I, I think that's always been a challenge for an investor like that in places like hedge funds as well as private equity. If 
few, few hundred billion dollars and you want to put 10% somewhere, that's a lot of money to, to put to work. So it either pushes you into mega <coughs> size point, uh, buyout funds um, or a lot of line items. And then how do you manage that internally? If you have all those line items, you need a huge staff and it just becomes hard to implement. Um, so um, if you would make an investment in private equity, we wouldn't recommend that you have 200 line items. You, know? <laughs> you, would, you would make uh, one investment with one fund to fund manager, and that fund to fund manager would then go out and have those 100 investments underneath the hood. So that way you have the diversification but there is that extra layer of fee, and that's what the study that Tim was alluding to did, didn't like, mm -hmm. right? It's that you need to pay someone to get you that diversification, but that's the only rational, uh, diversified way for you to ex get exposure to this market. Otherwise, you're too concentrated in too many eggs in one basket. Well, it seems like once you reach, reach the size of CalPERS, you can hire the guys with the secret right. sauce. You don't need to contract with them. Just bring them in house and. Well, here's the trick, though, is that people working in the private equity industry make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Calpers can't pay. Yeah. Yeah. They can't. They can't pay. But if they looked at their costs based on what they pay those managers and drug that up through the employee fund. They can up the, up the pay scale. Yeah, I, I might incentivize. Them. I, I don't know all the details of it, but I think optically, if mm -hmm. it's a political risk, if yeah. you're running a fund and you pay internal staff three million dollars, yeah. you could have paid external pay uh, six. Yeah, uh, it's easier for you to pay external six than internal three. Right, and I'm just making these numbers up. You know, I, I I don't work with them. I don't know anything about it. But that's kind of optically of it. Could you act? Could they actually stomach saying the highest paid person in the state of California is, is this person working on this with market? a pension plan too? <laughs> Plus, they probably couldn't do it because they're in a bargaining unit. The bargaining unit wouldn't approve uh, higher pay for some employees. <laughs> yeah. It, it's yeah. tough being right. the highest right. paid employee at a bank when you're a loan yeah. officer and the president of the bank makes less money than you. Yes. <laughs> well, I applied yes. for that job and I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> All right. So, benefits and considerations of private equity listed on slide 25. Um, again, should provide a return in excess of public equity over the long term. Um, the accounting is different, so the way that you look at returns for private equity, it's a valuation-based accounting. Um, so because it's not traded privately, uh, publicly over the counter, it's going to provide a differentiated return stream to your total portfolio return. Uh, now there is argument as to whether or not that's diversification because it is still equity, it's just the returns come in on a lagged valuation basis. Um, but uh, a good chunk of your peers invest in private equity. So when you look at performance of your total plan versus peers, we have to take into consideration that they are receiving that diversification effect from investing in private equity. So about 30% of public pension plans invest in private equity. Uh, when they do have an investment, typical allocation is about 6%. Yes? I have a question. When you, when you say peers, Yes. Um, we have, you know, different size systems, so yes. we have small, medium, large. When are you including all the, all of them? This is a broad peer yeah. group. Um, it is not segmented by asset asset size. So, of head, public pension plans overall, the larger plans are probably more likely to have a, a private equity allocation. Um, again, it's not the majority, but thirty percent is a pretty high number. Clear or Greg, um, with the enactment of AB 1824 and those additional reporting requirements in California for private uh, holdings uh, among pension funds like ours, have you seen any changes 
uh, in asset allocation among the California plans? Are they moving away from the, the private investments or is it just you deal with it? And then the second, secondly, is that having an impact on the managers and who's available to funds like ours, uh, those reporting requirements? Yeah, so uh, that was a, a reporting requirement that came out that is requiring uh, fee disclosure, different types of fee disclosure for what you're paying the uh, private equity managers or what they are earning within their fund. Not so much that you're giving them money, but what they're earning within the fund. And um, the uh, providers who want to do business in the state of California have to follow those rules now. So there was a legacy if you were if there were already investments with those funds, you can't force them to report a new way um, their compensation. But those that want any new money from any public fund in the state of California, they're going to have to start providing those fee disclosures. So um, um, I think there's still plenty of people who want to do business with public funds in the state of California, but there probably going to, there could be some partnerships that now say I don't want to go through that reporting requirement. But the uh, the managers that we would recommend to you naturally we would go through and do the work and say do you or can you comply with this reporting requirement right. um, that MSRA has? Okay. Any other questions or should we move on to real assets? Okay. Uh, so starting on slide 27, again in August of last year, you spent a fair amount of time talking about expanding the real asset exposure. Um, you currently have real estate as the sole real asset exposure in the portfolio. Um, we continue to think that that should comprise the core of your real asset exposure, but there is opportunity to diversify that some. Um, through the conversations in August, it was determined that unlisted open-end infrastructure appears to be the best, best fit for your portfolio as an opportunity to diversify. Uh, it does provide a reasonably high level of short-term correlation to inflation, so that's a, a key characteristic of it um, that we'll be looking for. Good diversifier to a stock and bond portfolio. We have an overview of real assets in general, but I'm gonna skip through that in the interest of time. Certainly strong benefits of having real assets as part of your portfolio. You benefit from that now with your real estate exposure. Uh, on slide 30, we start a discussion specifically to infrastructure. Um, so what are characteristics of infrastructure that are different than your current real estate exposure? Uh, they, there is demand for infrastructure even when other char uh, economic characteristics change. Um, so they typically can provide stable cash flow. They are very illiquid, uh, highly leveraged, uh, and are long-lived assets. So we have some different categories of infrastructure, economic infrastructure, social infrastructure, so bridges, toll roads, hospitals, uh, renewable energy, water and sewage, many different flavors of infrastructure uh, in which can be invested, but you would invest via a fund, right? So you wouldn't make uh, direct investment to a hospital. What, what do you mean by the, the, they're highly leveraged? So they take on a lot of debt. The borrowers highly leveraged? We, yeah. We have listed and li unlisted infrastructure on slide 31. Uh, focus is on unlisted, unlisted infrastructure for your portfolio. Um, so listed infrastructure would be publicly traded stocks of companies that are engaged in infrastructure related activities. So that's gonna be much more highly correlated to public equity, which you have not as good of a diversifier overall as investing in the asset level investments, which would be unlisted infrastructure. Uh, strengths of unlisted infrastructure are again, that they provide good portfolio diversification. Um, the cash flows are very durable. It is again an appraisal based valuation, similar to what we talked about with private equity, so that does reduce price volatility. Um, fees can be very high. 
again, it is the liquid is a long-term investment. Um, and there's a pretty thin supply of institutional products. So we have done some searches in this area. Um, there are viable managers for unlisted open-end infrastructure, uh, but it's not the long list that you would get if you did an active small cap growth manager search. So due dil diligence is certainly important there. Uh, there is a range of risk and return that can come out of different infrastructure portfolios and managers, uh, but the summary of conclusions from your August discussion is on slide 33, which we think still hold. Um, again, unlisted infrastructure through an open-end commingled fund offers the most compelling access point for the MSARA portfolio. Uh, it can diversify the real estate exposure that you currently have. Uh, better diversifies the rest of the investments in the total, total portfolio than other types of uh, real assets that you discussed at that time, so timber, et cetera. Um, and it does have a more conservative risk re return profile than listed infrastructure, which again would have more equity-like risk. Do you want to spend any more time on infrastructure specifically? Is this still an asset category that you're interested in hearing more about, um, potentially at a later meeting? Could you perhaps tell us what um, you found from the two searches that you've done? Last bullet point. I mean, what, what did you find when you did searches in that area? I wasn't directly involved in either of those searches, but I think one of the key takeaways is that, um, again, the, the list of viable managers is pretty thin. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certainly a couple, and there are more that are coming to market. Um, yeah, so there, um, there are kind of two categories. There's the um, closed-end and then the open-end funds. And the closed-end fund, there's a number of products out there, but the, the problem with closed-end funds is they lock you up for a long time. And infrastructure is even a longer horizon than uh, other private investments. Um, and, but these open-ended funds, there are a number of them that are um, have long-standing track records that you can look at. Uh, another interesting thing about them is they, uh, they, they tend to be global. So um, it's not just US, it's not just uh, toll roads in Chicago or pipelines in Alaska, it's also um, wind in Australia. Um, so it's their uh, global portfolios. Um, <coughs> And uh, so they're, they bring a real interesting uh, source of diversification for you. Um, so um, they're, um, if we do a search for you, we could bring you back a few different flavors for you to consider. Um, and, uh, and some of the global ones, I think, are uh, very interesting. And infrastructure investments in general are less popular in the U.S. They're growing in popularity, uh, but outside of the U.S. they are much more popular. So I think in Australia in particular, mm -hmm. um, they are a very popular investment for large institutional investors. And what's the big theme about that? Like there's a big current going through every investment. The big current going through this is that you need public-private partnerships to fund infrastructure going forward. It's not. A, a sovereign entity putting all this money into the toll road by themselves or building wind turbines, right? You need a partnership between public and private money. That's the big theme behind infrastructure. Do you have the stats like you had on the others about how many fellow public pension funds invest in? Is that in here too? Yeah, yeah so it, it falls under the broader category of uh, alternative real assets. Okay. All right. Um, so that's just part of that. So on slide 28, uh, public pension plans invested in real assets excluding real estate right. uh, is about 20%. But we don't know how much infrastructure is. Right, on. yeah. I imagine it's much lower than that. Yeah. So can you do those searches for us? Oh, yeah, we sure can. The last asset category, again, uh, under alternative real assets is commodities. We don't think we should make a dedicated allocation to commodities, but uh, we have a, a snapshot here of the asset class. Um, so commodities can provide a, a great inflation hedge. They are directly tied to inflation. Um, they can be very volatile. They are also the only asset category that's 
turned in a negative return over the trailing 10 year time period. Um, our Buy gold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Putting your retirement fund. Yep. So commodities can include agricultural products, wheat, cattle, energy products, gas, metal, gold, silver, etc. Um, typically basic goods that are the inputs in the production of other goods and services. Um, there are two typical investment approaches. Um, so institutional investors like yourself can invest in commodity futures or in commodity related equities. <coughs> so similar to um, listed infrastructure, investing in you know, equities uh, or com public companies that are uh, related to infrastructure, this is investing in public uh, companies that are related to commodities. So you're gonna have a, a, a risk return profile for uh, commodity related equities that is very similar to public equity. Uh, the better diversifier would be investing in futures contracts. We're not recommending that either. Some of the benefits and considerations of commodity futures and commodity related equities are on slides 35 and 36. Um, again, the, the key benefit of commodity futures would be a, a low to negative correlation with stocks and bonds. We think there are other asset categories that can provide diversification within your total por portfolio with a better uh, risk return profile for you. So, the big, um, so there was a big push towards commodity investments about 10 years ago, and that was everyone predicting inflation to take off because the Fed was so easy and um, with quantitative easing they said, oh, inflation must take off. If inflation takes off, commodity prices much, must take off. And, uh, and it never mm -hmm. materialized. Um, so, but that was kind of the big philosophical uh, theme pushing uh, investors towards commodities. Um, and uh, oil prices today are lower than they were 10 years ago. And that's a huge component of why commodities have performed so far. Okay, the last topic for today is global equity. Um, as I mentioned before, we think this is more of an implementation consideration. So I'll, I'll talk about it quickly, but I don't think we need to spend too much time here. Uh, page 38, I think, asks the good question of aren't you already global? Yeah. So what's the difference between what you have uh, and implementing global equity? Um, the difference is, again, that top-down philosophy versus implementing at global equity exposure in regional silos. Um, so currently, we have the, the equity target of your portfolio on the right-hand side here. You do have exposure to U.S. equity in different flavors, large cap, small cap, growth value. You do have exposure to international equities within small cap, emerging markets, developed markets. So you do have that exposure. Um, but implementing a global equity portfolio would be a globally integrated approach to uh, investing in those markets. Um, so yes, your global exposure exists. Uh, however, it is not exposure, uh, uh, global exposure in nature because a global mandate would give a manager the freedom to allocate to the US as well as non-US country, uh, countries. So as we stand now, um, we think that you can consider allocating to a global mandate as kind of a carve out of your overall equity allocation. So you'll go through the asset liability study, you will almost certainly keep an allocation to public equity, uh, and you could potentially carve out part of that to give to a global manager, a global mandate. Um, pros and cons of global equity are on slide 41. Uh, the idea being that you give a global equity manager kind of the broadest opportunity set. So take the entirety of the, the global universe, they're going to be managing to diff looking for different alpha sources. So alpha from allocating to regional country, global sector, security, and currency allocations within that portfolio versus just looking at the this is my Russell 2000 growth benchmark. What are the best stocks in this benchmark that I think are going to outperform the index over time? So it's kind of a philosophical component to implementation. Uh, global managers have an opportunity to benefit from thematic exposures. So long-term structural changes as they look at different countries. Where do they think they see the best opportunities? 
from a country uh, perspective. We think this is a good allocation to implement with active management. Uh, global mandates are going to have a larger cap bias than the current implementation of your public equity portfolio. So glo global cap weights are about 50-50, 50% US, 50% non-US. Um, a lot of global managers add value by giving a higher allocation to small cap. So there are different levers that they can pull to outperform their global benchmark. Um, and those are just considerations that we would take into, or things that we would take into consideration when doing a search. They can have higher risk. So regional allocations are a new source of, or a different source of risk. Currency effects can be strong, um, and there can be concentration risks as well. May I ask what the phrase uh, "anywhere best, go anywhere best" or something like that? Oh. Um, Go anywhere, go anywhere yeah. best ideas yeah. that so the broader your opportunity set uh, the more the d you, there are different approaches to adding alpha right so um, if your opportunity set is just small cap growth stocks then you can kind of only go within that smaller universe a global manager has the whole of the global stock universe to add alpha Uh, we do think a global equity manager uh, mandate can be a good complement to um, the regional siloed approach that you have within public equity. Um, we're not pounding the table for it, but it is a different approach, right? So uh, the managers you have now are largely stock pickers, bottom-up stock pickers to build their portfolios within those regional sleeves. A global equity mandate um, would be a manager that's thinking more top-down. How do we want to allocate capital across the globe of, of stock opportunities? Are there any questions? Again, we don't think that decision needs to be made today. Uh, that would be kind of a secondary implementation consideration um, once the decision has been made of how much to allocate to equity, bonds, or other asset classes in the uh, asset liability study. So yes? That quickly, uh, I think Greg, you talked about this a little earlier, like for example, real, or real assets. And I think you said real estate is 10% of our portfolio, we might do 5% of that into a real asset, which would be like $5 million. Yeah. And if that particular investment made 10% in a year, would we even know? Would 10% of 5% of our portfolio make any difference in the overall return? Uh, it, it, we're talking about uh, real estate now? Specifically. Any, any one of them. Because we're going um, yeah. to be investing a small amount, and if if that has a small amount has a good return, what will it do to the total portfolio? Would we able to look, look at it and say, "Ooh, if we didn't do that, we wouldn't have gotten"? Yeah, that's our that's return. that. I think that's a, a real interesting point, Tim, and it's um, it's something that you got to think about. It. There's so many ideas out there that you can pick and invest in. Um, and if you put all the ideas in, it becomes really hard to implement and to monitor and, and to know what's really going on and with really very small impact, right? If, so if, uh, commodities, for example. Um, some investors might want to invest in commodities. So if you put it in the real asset portfolio, it might be 10% of the real asset portfolio, which is 11% target. So 1% of your portfolio in commodities, and then you need to go through this whole education section about how do I invest in commodities, and I need multiple managers, and, and it's not going to move the needle at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's a, I think that's a, um, uh, a keen observation uh, about implementation. Now with global equity, what Claire was just talking about, you've got 60% of your money in equities. So you could very well have, uh, I didn't run these numbers, but you know, 30% dedicated domestic equity, 20% international equity, and then some other component. I'm, I'm slow today, I'm not good with that, but some other component to global equity. And it could, that could still be a meaningful percent allocation to you. But some of these other asset classes we've talked about today are would not be as meaningful a percentage for you. 
it, when you do a search, the same, I, I, I would support us going further looking at infrastructure. We'll start there. Okay. When you do the search, you, can you get a sense from the, the uh, managers? Are they transportation? Are they utilities? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and also, this is a different one for me, is uh, regions. I mean, if it's international, it's international. But I think of you know, economic growth areas in, like, in the United States. It's like, oh, I'm going to go into transportation in Atlanta. There's you know, new roads, new yeah. tollways, and so forth. Do you, do you get a sense of that working with these people where they yeah. are? Yeah, so um, with the closed end funds, <laughs> you don't know what the investments are yet. Okay. Uh, because you give them money, then they go make the investments. With the open-end funds, a good thing, and that's what we think is better for you, is you can look at the existing portfolio. Mm -hmm. You can say, okay, what, what am I going to share in if I put my capital in here? Mm -hmm. um, so they can, you actually have a pretty good look at what the investments are. Um, and, uh, and we could give you a lot of detail on that. So is that, um, does that help the uh, direction of where we want to go is um, to do more research on the open-ended infrastructure and that that could be part of the global equity? Um. So yeah, so a couple things we could do. Uh, one, today you could say, you know what, Claire and Greg, we, we kind of agree with you. We like infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We either are or are not convinced on private equity. I want you to conduct an asset liability study that's going to look at, from a big picture, how much money do I have in each category. And you show, you bring that study back to me, mm -hmm. and then I'll make the decision, well, this doesn't move the needle for me, this does. Okay. That's one thing we could do. Alternatively, you could say, uh, you know what, some of this sounded interesting to me. I'd like you to come back and tell me more about one specific thing or two specific things for you to become uh, you know, more confident in directing us to include them in the asset allocation study. So it's kind of up uh, to you. So what's the pleasure of the board doing? I'm hearing, you know, I'm hearing that we're interested in infrastructure. Yeah. And otherwise, um. Well, I'm looking at uh, slide 44 where they've highlighted both private equity and infrastructure and would like to know what James thinks. Uh, as uh, Claire mentioned, uh, you know, we talked about infrastructure as part of a real asset discussion in August. I think that's a, a good opportunity for us and the board's previously expressed interest in that. I think we absolutely want to move forward with including that in the asset liability modeling. Uh, private equity, we, we included that in the asset liability modeling three years ago when we did this and the board ultimately decided not to include private equity. Um, I still like the asset category. not a fan of the layering of fees that we would have to have with doing the fund to fund yeah. mm -hmm. but i agree with greg that that is the only approach for us to get into private equity um, so I, I see no harm in including that in the asset liability modeling and when that comes back we could get some more uh, information and education around private equity private equity and the use of fund to funds and and what that means in terms of the net net at the end of the day. Um, everything else that, that we've talked about here, hedge funds don't meet up with our investment beliefs. Multi-asset, uh, I think, is a little bit closer, but still doesn't perfectly align with our investment beliefs. Commodities, well outside our investment beliefs, I think. Uh, private credit, credit may but it seems to be more opportunistic and not a true long-term type of strategy uh, so that doesn't necessarily line up as well um, I also I have to uh, throw out the great quote that uh, I won't attribute here but private private credit is just equity risk and drag um, <laughs> 
and there's something to that. You're really, you know, you are getting equ equity-like risk with amped up fixed income returns, uh, especially in today's market uh, with uncertain economic times that we're facing today. So um, all of that, I think I'm on the same page with, with Greg and Claire. I like moving this forward, then bringing us back some more information about the private equity, the fund of funds, and, and how that helps us net net, um, and then bringing some modeling to the board to look at. So. If I, if I can, may I? Go ahead. Um, I know I spoke up about private equity uh, the last time around, and we disagree a little bit on this, but I certainly bow to your educational supremacy when it comes to talking about this. <laughs> but I really would like that article to get okay. to everyone, because there are reasons that CalSTRS and CalPERS have moved away from private equity. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a situation, we already are high risk yeah. in our portfolio. Mm -hmm. And to me, private equity is more so. Mm -hmm. So yeah. infrastructure does appeal because yeah. I see that as a, a lesser risk and something that is contrary to what we have been doing, which mm -hmm. increases you know, our, our Opportunities and our diversity in our right. area. That's fair. I think y'all know. I I'd really like to see us get involved in private lending, direct private lending, and not mix that up at all with 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 private equity. Private equity yeah. lending, lending to businesses, lending on real estate. One is not leverage. And so uh, I'd really like to see us explore that. And I'd like to, to see what I don't know is who a purveyor is. I know, I know one yeah. purveyor. Yeah. And I don't know many competitors. I don't know. So, but I'd like, you know, we need to find, if we want to do that, we need to find others to do that. Right. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to have you look into who, if we decided that we wanted to do some direct lending, who would be uh, a manager? And real handle. estate lending. Real, yeah, not, real estate lending, not, not business lending. Not business, okay. So how about how about this? How about, will Callen will march forward with the AL study, and with big building blocks, we will include private equity and infrastructure with direct real estate lending. That will be a subcomponent of real estate. Mm -hmm. Because if, if we put a few percent in that, it's not going to change the AL study modeling, right? So, so, uh, so the steps of the process are going to be, okay, we're going to do big picture modeling with big asset class buckets. And we can treat uh, real estate lending as a component of your real estate allocation. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't see real estate lending as a component of owning real estate. Okay. It's lending, and it, right. it's, it's in. Yeah, I see it. Not I see where it where it drives us. I mean, what what drives me to want to do it is our fixed income component yeah. of our portfolio. Yeah. Our our actuaries have targeted that at like a two percent rate of return. Right. So I'm I'm not putting real estate <coughs> lending up against our targeted eight percent for stocks and bonds. They're, they're different, they're in different silos. And if we can do direct lending and move that needle from 2% to 5.5% net cost in that silo, then we're really making a difference. So you're, you're thinking of it as a fixed income substitute, <coughs> not a component of real estate? No. Okay. Yes. So in the the study, I mean, we, we have basically 21% of domestic fixed income. And so should we look at taking 5% out of everything else, spread it around, making that a 25, 26%, and then look at adding these things in that Lee's talking about. I fully support what he's talking about. And infrastructure. I mean, actually moving a little bit of the, um, the value, more of the value of the domestic fixed income. I mean, I looked at 
those charts you showed for the yeah. short durations and the spread between what the bonds were doing and what the equities were doing on those periods and the spreads when you uh, apply the size, the relationship of our bond holdings to our equity holdings barely doesn't really move the needle much. And the biggest spread there was it changed 6% the loss on the on those bar graphs you had. It was back to something. No, it was page. It was very early in the presentation. It actually, went to a different document. Um, but all I'm saying is, our bond holdings don't have a monster effect if the oh. equities go in the dump, right? right. And yeah. then if we yeah. add five percent to that, it ups the percent a little bit. Yeah. For every three dollar, for every I would put this for every three dollars in equity loss we have, we would have right now we would have to have nine dollars yeah. made yep. in the bond issue to make so it's really mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a big spread there. And, yeah. and maybe this is becoming more conservative in a way. So anyway, to sum it up, infrastructure study, what Lee's talking about with private lending and on the real estate, and then possibly moving up to five percent more into the Fixed, either into fixed income or things like infrastructure, yeah. moving it out of equity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Moving five percent out of equity. There we go. Okay. That's what I'd like to see. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, what I think might make sense is if we come back to you and specifically not give you managers, but say how would you implement? Like what would the funds generally look like in? private real estate debt, private equity and infrastructure. So everyone kind of gets a feel, okay, what is the actual investment? And at the same time, we'll start working on the study to say if we had those pieces in place, what would an efficient mix look like with um, your current four asset class plus those three? And in, in, in looking at real estate debt too, um, I, I would not want to look, I mean, personally, I would not want to look at mezzanine debt, you know, mm -hmm. secondary mortgages, you know, second mortgages. Uh, I want to be in first place, I want to be like 50, 60 percent. So we, we want to look the really conservative loans for the borrowers, you know, they're going to lose their wife and children and everything before yeah. we even get a call. Right. So. So because, they, you know, on that graph that you have on page 32, I think it is, where it shows the, the line of risk and reward, yeah. uh, that is a really informative uh, yeah. picture. Right. I, I, I recommend everybody memorize that graph. It, it, it's really a wonderful tool. Yep. Yeah. 32? Yeah, is it 32? 32? Yes, 32. The risk and reward curve. Is that what page it is? Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a that's a really cool part. Yeah. And uh, and this is, that that applies to real estate as well as infrastructure. Yeah, everything. Yeah. So uh, looking at debt, I want to be in the core of debt. Yeah. So conservative real estate, right. private real estate debt. Okay. I think we I think have we're good. direction. Okay, perfect. Okay. I would also like to go back and revisit the investment belief statement so that we can so, approve. Yes. So I made some edits um, to the uh, belief statement and was hoping to tie this off and get it done today so we can okay. put it to bed. Um, edits it in line with the board comments. Uh, I've edited it to now read belief one, focus on the long run. In accordance with the strategic plan adopted by the board, M. Sarah is a long-term investor and holds a 50-plus year investment horizon. As a long-term investor, the M. Sarah board concentrates its efforts on strategic decision-making via the asset allocation. And then everything else remains the same. And I can share this if anyone wants to look at it rather than listen to it. <laughs> That's good. Mm -hmm. I think so. 
Um, make a motion to accept yes. the yeah. account. No, I, thought I, I thought I could. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to make one. Alan. Well, I'll make a motion to adopt the investment belief statement as revised. Second. Okay. All those in favor of um, adopting the investment belief statement? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay. Abstain? Okay. Motion passes and the investment belief statement is approved. Thank you, Madam Chair. This was a real good presentation. Yeah, thank you. 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 Yeah. It feels like it's doing that. Yeah. It's a seat adjustment. Not everybody else. Let's do, let's do it afterwards. Okay. Call the meeting back to order at 10.20. Roughly. Roughly. Okay. Um, the next item on our agenda is the uh, discussion and possible action regarding the 2019 board work plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Trustees, you have the board work plan before you. Um, I will run through this very, very quickly, focusing on the items in red, which are new or updates. Uh, nothing changing on the first page. We're still continuing to work on all of our projects here and uh, staying on track with everything. Um, page two, uh, you see the new uh, client feedback uh, numbers, 4.67 out of 5, with 9 out of 27 responses. Um, the new supervisor meetings, uh, I added those on here just to, to uh, make you aware. I did meet with both of the new supervisors in February this year, had good conversations, and those were timed before the actuary's presentation of the Board of Supervisors. Okay. Um, <clears throat> client presentation, we have our next client uh, seminar, the Retirement 101 seminar. Scheduled for May 1st. It will be in the morning. I believe it's a either a 10 or a 10:30 start time um, in the Board of Supervisors Chambers. Uh, that is a Wednesday. Uh, I also got uh, finally got up to the Willits Rotary in March, um, so that's good. Um, and then on to page three, you see that uh, thankful, thankful, uh, thankfully we were actually able to complete the investment beliefs today. Um, and then we're working on the policy review and the asset liability study still. I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. When did you put the green check on there? <laughs> Today. Yeah. I, I did. I put it on there last week anticipating that we would finish this today. <laughs> That's why he edited it. Of course. On that, that first paragraph. Of course. <laughs> Unless you count on us. Well, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. One thing. I mean, it's not in red, but it did catch my attention. You had a status of proposed on an off-site meeting. Uh -huh. So whenever we get to decide when those are, because I'm already planning my travel <coughs> dates. <coughs> you are such a retiree. I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, here. On the Which page is that? Oh, it's on page three. Okay. It just says quarter three. Okay, yes, Q3. Um, last time we did it, I believe it was in September. Mm -hmm. um, I have absolutely no details yet. Um, I'm assuming the board wants to do it off site again this year. <laughs> Yeah. And it would be in lieu of the meeting. We would have our meeting. Yes, we have. Time. Last time we did this, we did a regular board meeting, yeah. and uh, as part of the offsite. And it's just a one day or over and back the same. Um, not even sure. Uh, haven't really put any thought into it yet. What we would do, what we need to cover. Um, 
Well, if you keep it in that same week when the meeting is, I've already reserved that week to stay in there. Okay. <laughs> Noted. Um, Hawaii calls. Yes. <laughs> is that where we're going to hear Excellent. That's one of three places that I would yeah. never go to a work conference. So. Yes. Huh. Yes. Why have you had that experience? <laughs> no. No. Just the optics. Just the optics. Yeah. Hawaii, yeah. Vegas, and Orlando. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can keep Orlando. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> optics. Um, so. I'm hearing no strong objections to an offsite, no, a slight yeah, preference good. for a, a single day or multiple or days. Or two. I think the two days is good. That, that last one, the day, you know, getting over there and then our meeting was eight plus hours, wasn't it? Oh, wow. That was horrible on me with my miserable back. And I, I think the overnight is an opportunity for just some plain camaraderie as well. Mm -hmm. You know, dinner or whatever. Can okay. I inquire where ours was held last year so I understand what we're talking about? We were in Mendocino. <laughs> okay. In the town of Mendocino. Um, Fort Bragg. Yeah, we can do the new Fort Bragg. Bragg. Oh, what we were in Mendocino last year. We were in Fort Bragg one year. Two years we had, uh, last year we had a meeting in Fort Bragg. Yeah. But that was not oh, okay. an off-site. Okay. Right. Um, that was just an alternate meeting location. Yeah. And then where okay. were we at the Hill House? I believe it was. Yeah. Two, yeah. two years ago. And this would be in lieu of that month's meeting. Mm -hmm. Yes. It would cover that month's topic. Yes. So yeah. I understand it. Yeah. Well, no, it goes into a lot more than just well, covering the topic. Yeah, right. We minimize the regular biz and maximize the Strategic planning. Plan. <laughs> we, yeah. we did. We planned and planned and planned. We did the hotel hotel. Okay. What did you say? Will you be Doing naughty it. up there again? No, we can go to the Hotel Hopper. <laughs> I think he's yeah. volunteering his house. He's done by that. That beautiful yeah. black thing. Be done by thing. thing. Oh. Oh. How many rooms do they have? 20. Oh. In June, in Point Arena, we'll have a conference center. Who? Point Arena. Really? Yeah. Hmm. That'd be cool. So do we want to put that on the next agenda to figure out where we're where it's going to be or do we want to do or this you, now or you bring us back oh. suggestions <laughs> so that's what you did before you did yeah mm -hmm. okay and, and yes the optics matter yes so. <laughs> right. it, it, just a thought as i was looking around there's 13 of us plus if staff goes maybe 15. if there's 15 13 of us come from inland and two from the coast would make more sense to bring them here than send all of us there. Except, I know you're worried about except your Except we come over 11 other times a year. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 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 Fairly put. Find a place that will allow dogs and I know you won't worry quite as much. Dogs in wheelchairs. Oh. We pick the middle oh, point, like dogs in wheelchairs. Anderson Valley. Yes. Like what? I a midpoint, like Anderson Valley. Anderson Valley. Be, yeah, yeah, that yeah. Yeah. Goes to a winery that got to <laughs> 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 Well, here it's good. It's okay. <laughs> so are we good with the update on the work plan? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and moving on to um, discussion of possible action regarding assessment and determination of compensation policy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Trustees, you have the policy with proposed edits. Uh, um, and I will apologize. Uh, I found another edit I needed to add um, just last night in uh, section one, purpose and background. Um, the last uh, three words there, compensation earnable resolutions, I would propose amending the draft you have before you to include the same edit that's in the next paragraph in section two to say, and all adopted pensionable compensation resolutions and compensation earnable resolutions. Other than that, I would uh, recommend. So you're adding pensionable in the second time? Yes. Or in the first In the first paragraph, yes. Yes. And my apologies for not finding that the first time. 
Do we need a motion to approve? Or adopt? No, well, the rest is just referring to a different policy. Right. That is correct, and I, I guess I should highlight that. The, the assessment and determination of compensation policy did have an outline of mm -hmm. what uh, of an appeal, mm -hmm. but since the board has adopted an administrative hearing process, this these amendments here deleting all this language that had the appeals uh, information. Now we just refer to the administrative hearing process and we'll follow that. Okay. Uh, if a member or employer wishes to uh, contest a staff decision. So adding that pensionable in front of those two places, should the topic be uh, pensionable compensation policy as opposed to just compensation policy? Uh, I, I think it's fine as compensation because uh, the, the resolutions, cur the current policy says compensation earnable resolutions and the name of the policy just says compensation. Mm -hmm. um, they both have compensation in there. The when I first read that on the agenda, I thought we were talking about compensation for retirement employee, retirement system employees. I didn't pick up at first that it had to do with pensionable compensation until I got into it and read it. Okay. Then I just heard. So it'd be clearer. We could um, change that to assessment and determination of Pension. pensionable compensation and compensation earnable policy. Mm -hmm. yeah if that's the pleasure of the board. When PEPRA was enacted, it changed the term, for, it, it, it kind of created a new term for PEPRA employees calling it pensionable compensation. So it's just a bit of a mouthful, but it's totally form over substance, so whatever you want to do. Well, I think it is clearer to the, you know, someone who's just looking at it for the first time. Um, so if we wanted so if we're going to add some extra words there, we could shorten this to, um, instead of assessment and determination, mm -hmm. just determination mm -hmm. of pensionable compensation and compensation earnable yes. policy. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Good. Mm -hmm. So do we need a motion? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. With those changes, I move that we adopt the assessment and determination compensation policy. A second? Second. Second. Okay. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. Okay. Next on the agenda, uh, discussion possible action mm -hmm. regarding uh, direction to and Sarah, voting delegate regarding the State Association of County Retirement Systems, May 10th, 2019 Board of Directors election. Thank you, Madam Chair. Trustees, you have the uh, Sackers business packet uh, before you. The only uh, item to be voted upon at the Sackers meeting in May is the uh, election of Board of Directors officers. Uh, for the 2019-2020 uh, Sackers year. Um, the nominating committee has put forth a recommended slate of candidates or list of candidates for all of the different uh, officer positions. Um, I would recommend that, the, that we support that uh, recommended list of candidates, especially the secretary. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. <laughs> Well, thank you. <laughs> Is that list in here anywhere? Yeah, I think it's, mm -hmm. uh, if you're on a computer, I think it's page 27. Oh, okay. It's way into it. Okay. Well, move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. Mm -hmm. Do you have one quick question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'll so I never looked at their budget. So why do they have a two and a half million dollars oh, yeah. in assets? Yeah, isn't that crazy? They and, have a lot of money. And if they do, do we pay dues? No, <laughs> it's you know what? It's misleading because they are on a cash basis rather than a cruel basis. And so that money gets used. It's not it's not that they just have all this extra um, all these extra assets. It's so they spend two and a half million dollars a year? 
Well, with the conferences and everything, it is very expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are our dues with this group? We don't. Well, we, Judy, do we pay? Is we it pay an annual. <coughs> um, I think it's four thousand annually. Okay, well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> no, I mean, I was thinking like with that much money, what are the dues? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is Jan doing a third term, or is this? Yeah. So I mean, so this is a third third year term. Yeah. Yeah. Why does Harvard have a thirty-eight billion dollar uh, endowment? Aren't they doing based on the size of your? Yes. yes. Yeah, that's so we small. we pay the least right. amount. Yeah. I believe that's correct. It's really the LA County. They have the lion's share of, of everything. <laughs> what is their their um, their pension fund is like over forty billion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Astounding. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Um, if we look at page twenty three, and this is just to probably beat a dead horse. Okay. But this whole divestment thing was something that came up back when I was on the CalSTRS board. We had our first groups of students coming in and um, they only wanted a small divestment of this and then it became that. And now you can see there's Turkey, private pris prisons, state contracting, Every chance we get, I think, it, I know the, the retired teachers had a speaker last month who wanted CalSTRS to divest from any anything that's related to using petroleum products. Right. So um, a little door opening leads to a real slippery slope. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I just hope that we will always speak up in opposition yeah. to any right. direction to yeah. divest. Well, yeah, because it, that limits our options. The, the um, divestment from tobacco for CalSTRS mm -hmm. lost us over a billion dollars over a three-year period of time. And you know, you have underfunded pension plans and that's real money. And no one's more opposed to tobacco than I am. But uh, anyway, my that's my soapbox. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I hope we can move on to the administrative report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Trustees, you have the administrative report before you. Two items only, uh, and a third I'm going to throw in here. Uh, the evaluation process begins next month. Uh, we'll be distributing uh, paperwork and uh, the executive director's self-evaluation to the board uh, as at the June board or at the May board meeting, and then the evaluation will take place during the June board meeting. Didn't we just? That's exactly what I was going to say. Yes. Didn't we just do that? It, it is an annual. Some of the issues may have, may have drug on a little bit longer than yes. just the annual evaluation because of uh, contract mm -hmm. That's negotiations. True. That's so. true. So. Yeah. yeah. They put a, a frowning face on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I may be imagining it, but did you send us an email saying that you there was someone hired for the new no. manager? Uh, for the uh, uh, yes, yes, I did. I did not include that here because I had emailed the board previous, previously. Previously. Uh, we have hired a finance investment officer, uh, Robert Rovellis, will be starting on Monday. Um, very excited about him. Uh, he's got some skills. Uh, anyone who can manage to get a physics degree from RPI uh, must have some, uh, some intelligence and some serious math skills. So. Okay. Um, my apologies for not including that here. Uh, the uh, legislative update is included. There are more bills listed now than there were previously. We're up to 21, although none of them, I, I think, are significantly potentially impactful for us. Um, the final thing I wanted to mention here, I didn't list it. Um, <clears throat> we have moved in the direction of using Filer as our trustee portal uh, so we can, and there previously it was a little bit bifurcated and that our public documents 
were on our website and then trustees had to log in separately to filer to see closed session documents. What we're doing now is we're going to put all of your documents in filer so you'll log in there every month to see all of your documents. Um, the public documents will still be on our website. You can go there, absolutely. But we're going to start using that as a portal. And if we've got other things we want to share with you, we'll put them there as well. Um, the FAQ that we've pre previously distributed, I plan to put those on the filer so that you'll have access to those all the time. Uh, if you ever want to go back and reread or someone asks you a question and you think to yourself, what, how did we say that? You can go back there. So, Is it just me or when I opened up a document on filer and then I went to open another document, I had to log in again to, to mm -hmm. open mm -hmm. another document? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, it was just a glitch then. Mm -hmm. If you have questions or need some assistance, let Judy know. Um, and we'll so it wasn't there. set up this month. I know if you touch on the email um, address in her email, it brought up filer and I was having a hard time getting through it. So maybe it wasn't done when I was looking at it. So if you're using the iPad, rather than using the link in the email, you want to use the filer app. That's the easiest way. If you're on another device, then you'll need that link. You can use Filer from any computer, you, even your home computer, using the link in the email. But on your iPads, it, it works best if you use the Filer app, which is right on your home screen. Mm -hmm. The little blue folder says Filer. And the order of documents, we're trying to improve on the order. Um, right now, you'll see it by meeting date. And then when you open that meeting date, then you'll see closed session folders. And then you'll see the agenda and all of the additional agenda items following. So it'll all be in a list. So you won't have to go back and forth between the website and Filer. It's all going to be on Filer. It'll be nice. OK. That concludes my report, Madam Chair, unless there are any questions. Thank you. Um, and then we're moving to general board member discussion. Do we have any discussion? Yes. I just want to tell not Dick Shoemaker, Richard Shoemaker, that I'm so glad after reading about his demise in the day of journal, which you're sitting there. Uh, <laughs> I, I miss that. Tommy Wayne Kramer <laughs> <laughs> talked about losing his friend Dick Shoemaker. I can't remember the Mark Queen quote around that, but there is There one. is one, yes. yes. Uh, any other discussion? So, moving forward to closed session. I think it's reports of my demise have been great news. That's it. Yeah. That's yeah. That's funny. Okay. We are back. Um, any other discussion? So, uh, uh, on the matter of Richard Spalling, Sperling, the uh, board voted unanimously to grant a service-connected disability retirement and also gave direction to staff on a conference with legal counsel, direction was given to staff and counsel. Did you want to include the 18 month thing? That was the direction to staff. Okay. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Third. We adjourn at 12 o'clock. And the uh, next meeting will be Wednesday, May 15th. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're good. I just got some uh, changes to that email.